the problem that we have right now is that I have so much that I want to share with you, and I know we all have dinner coming up. So I propose we skip the whole like, introduction, get to know you phase, and just kick the door open from the beginning. I promise we'll become friends as we go. But All right. But here's the deal. There is one thing we have to talk about first, because I know that in our culture, when most people think about magic or magicians, the image that comes to mind is one of laser beams and smoke machines and tight leather pants and top hats and rabbits, right? And, and if I'm standing here on this stage talking to you as I will about magic as this sincere and genuine way to encounter wonder, and the whole time you're out there picturing like Job from Arrested Development, you know? <laughs> Who has been the bane of my existence. <laughs> if, if that's what you're thinking, we're never going to understand each other. I feel like for, for all of my career, and almost all of my life, for basically as long as I can remember, I've been trying to say one thing as a magician, and, and that's what I want to do today. So I'm going to start by telling you my story, and then in the middle it will open up and take on this uh, sort of hopefully universal uh, relevance. Promise big and then over deliver is the... <laughs> so I became a magician by accident when I was nine years old. When I was nine years old, I read the Lord of the Rings books. I know they're famous movies now, but raise your hand if you read the books. Yeah? Okay. So there's, there's this scene in the first book where one of the characters is a wizard named Gandalf, and, and he's at this birthday party, and Gandalf the wizard uses his real magic to create this giant firework dragon that swoops down over the party and terrifies everybody. They're screaming and running away, and I thought, that's what I want. Uh, <laughs> I, I had this idea that if I could do that on the playground at school, I could impress girls and frighten bullies, and just those were both pretty high on my list of priorities. <laughs> but nine is a curious age because you're old enough to slog through 1,300 pages of pretty dense fantasy literature, but young enough to still hold out hope at the end of it that maybe there's such thing as real, actual magic. So when I finished, I went to the library looking for a book of spells to do that firework trick. <laughs> Turns out that's not how it works. <laughs> but I did find a book of basic sleight of hand technique, and I learned my first truly great piece of magic. It's very simple. You put a coin in your hand, you close it, when you open it, the coin's gone. Now, any magic trick at the beginning does not look anything like magic. Uh, it just looks like a trick, and at the beginning, it's a terrible trick. I had to practice this over and over and over again, and, and you know how little kids become fixated on certain things, sometimes it's sports or video games? For me, for whatever reason, I just became captivated with this idea that I could practice this and make it look like something magical was happening. So I'd, I'd wake up before school and practice, I'd come home after school and practice, and there was a moment where it didn't look like a trick where it looked right over my hand, and it just looked like by magic, the coin disappeared. So I decided that it was time I was going to go to the playground and show everybody my new amazing ability. The thing that I didn't know then that I have learned since is that out of context, magic is not fun. Out of context, magic is terrifying. <laughs> if I were to, like, we're, this isn't a show, we're just talking. If I were to stand here right now and just disappear, <laughs> that would scare the living shit out of you, right? <laughs> you, you would run from this theater as quickly as possible. And it's, it's possible that on the way out, you would also be filled with this secret thrill that maybe the world is bigger than you'd thought. But, but your first response would be to scream and run away. So these kids on the playground didn't know that they were watching a magician. They didn't know it was a trick. They just saw something disappear. So they didn't laugh, they didn't clap. They just started shrieking <laughs> and running. <laughs> so 
So imagine, if you will, you are the teacher on duty <laughs> on the playground, and you look across the schoolyard, and you see this group of students running away, screaming, and I'm standing there in the middle. So this teacher, and I was terrified of this woman. She was a, a stern, authoritarian, domineering presence. I felt like she was 10 feet tall. She stormed over and demanded that I show her whatever it was that I'd showed the kids to make them run away. So I took out my coin. Magic's really hard when your hands are shaking. But by this point, I had done it like 4,000 times, and so I did the trick for her, and the coin disappeared. And when I looked up, it was as though she had become a little girl again. The, the transformation, is, it's almost impossible to overstate. In one moment, she was this sort of angry, sort of threatening figure, and the next moment, just by magic, she was smiling and delighted. And, you know, she maybe wasn't screaming and jumping as loud as the other kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I will remember that, that look of wonder on her face forever. That moment changed my life forever. And I will explain why. But because it's so important that you really can see it in your own mind, I'd like to show you a video. I want you to see how magic looks from my perspective. Can we, can we start the video that we recorded yesterday? Yesterday, I went to the picnic and was doing magic for some people. And I just want you to see this. In a moment, the, <laughs> the woman in... In a moment, the woman in the middle is going to turn over two playing cards. It's not going to mean anything to you because you haven't seen the trick, but I don't want you to watch the trick. I want you to watch her reaction. <laughs> I'd like to start with something simple. I'm holding something in my hand right now. I can't show it to you, I can't tell you what it is, but Rebecca, I'd like you to hold it for me. Okay. So here's how this will work. Hold your hands, can I, yeah, maybe get rid of your crap for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing up for sleep. I have to give this to you in a way that you don't see it, that no one sees it, this has to stay a secret. Okay. So make your hands into a bowl. I'm gonna drop something in your hand. It's going to feel very strange. <laughs> try not to drop it and try not to give it away with your face, okay? So okay. open your hands just a little bit. Look away, no peeking, look away, no peeking. I'm gonna drop something in your hands. As soon as you feel it hit your palm, seal your fingers around it. And then, and then lock your hands together so, so nothing could happen to it. Okay. Two things are important now. The first is I did actually give you something. I'm not just making this yeah. up, is that right? Second, I'm just curious. Do you have a guess about what I gave you or, or, or not? Don't say if you think you know. I'm just curious. Yes or no? Do you think you know? Yeah, I have a guess. Okay. Let's, let's think of this as a prediction. That'll work for now. Joe, will you help me with this? Sure. In a moment, I'm going to have you touch the back of a playing card. Okay. When you go back and think about this when I'm done, the only explanation will be that somehow I was able to force you to choose the card that I wanted. Okay. So I want you to take a moment and, and I want you to know in your heart of hearts that this is your choice and I'm not making you choose one. Okay. So hold your finger out. I'm just going to run the cards back and forth. Whenever you feel so inspired, drop your finger down on one and just leave it there. I'm sorry, which one? That one. Okay. Yeah. That was yours. I couldn't have made you choose that. Is that fair? Okay, I want you to remember it. I can see it too, doesn't matter. Can I give these to you for a moment? More than anything, I want you to hear this. Listen. Jack of Hearts, I'm going to tear a corner from Joe's card. That corner is going to disappear. Oh, what? No. <laughs> Which is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you remember I before I even took the cards out of my pocket I gave you something to hold. Yes. 
open your hands like this and show them. Okay. Whoa. 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 No way. <laughs> what? Whoa. Wait, wait. Wow. Like it doesn't just match closely, like fiber for fiber. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do this uh, out here just so the camera can see. I'm going to put an X on my arm, and I'll hold that for a moment just so you can get the the shot. And you, like you can see, it's permanent. I want you to see this. David, look on your arm. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> That's great. What? No. Oh. I'm girl in magic. Wow. Girl in magic. What? Oh. Wait, what? What? Oh, oh wow. That's a devil's yeah. <laughs> Anthony. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, it's gonna get crazy. Uh, yeah. I, I understand you don't you don't care now, but in a moment you're going to be curious if these are real. Okay. I don't know what a trick rubber band looks like, but like just see <laughs> before we get into it that they are what I say they are, right? You know what? These rubber bands are rubber band approved. Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> Illinois, rubber band inspector. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do it. Step step in so you can see Let's this. Step in. Nice close. Wherever you're standing, I want you to just appreciate that if I hold them like this, there's no way to separate them, right? Well, look at this. Watch this. All right, let's, let's run that again. Anthony, hold, hold your fingers like okay. this, right? Okay. Here's, I'm probably going to be, be as solid as possible. Just make two fists so it can't come off. Because if I were you watching this, yeah. I would wonder if maybe before you're really paying attention, I sort of fake you out and secretly start on that side because it's sort of like an optical illusion, right? That yeah. looks like they're together, yeah. but that's not amazing. Uh -huh. So I, I, want you, I want you to see clearly that I'm starting on Anthony's. And like you can see it on the side, right? Anthony, you can feel it, right? I'm not yeah. making this up. You can feel them stretch out. Look at this one. What? what? <laughs> Hold it tighter. <laughs> yeah, that was as material as possible. Uh, one job, man. So, yeah. so that's that's cool, but let me show you the crazy thing. Anthony, drop that one on the ground. Take Take your left arm and put it all the way through this one. Okay. Just put it all the way through. And then okay. make a fist squeeze tight. Okay. I want you to see I'm not going to take this over your fist, right? All right. Everyone else is going to see this. I want you to feel it, right? Okay. I want you to feel it come right. Ooh. <laughs> I don't understand. What? Wait, what? Wait. All right, look, let me tell everybody. First off, that felt magical. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that even means, but it felt like some magic was happening. <laughs> and that's weird. I don't know. You see the light. I tried. Yeah. I tried. My arm was solid the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, I, should I move? I don't know. Should I move? <laughs> could, could we have one round of applause for everyone who is in the video? <laughs> Unfortunately, you all were so good that I'm going to need you to quit your jobs and come on tour with me. So <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fun watching a video like that now. But you can imagine for a nine-year-old doing magic and having your teacher or your parents or your grandparents, like basically all of the adults in your world Having them respond like that was really confusing for me. Like, it was cool, but it was also very disorienting. Um, a young magician learns pretty quickly the, the extraordinary difference between how 
adults act almost all the time. And the difference between that and then how they act when they see magic, you know? It's just, it's night and day. I couldn't stop thinking about that teacher on the playground who, who, who transformed from this stern authoritarian figure to, to someone totally different. I didn't, I didn't become a magician because I wanted to be in show business. And I think if I could find a way to do this without being in show business, I would do it. I, I became a magician because I discovered at a really young age that you, could, that you could say something with a piece of magic that was hard to say any other way. And I wanted to figure that out. I wanted to chase that as far as I could go. There's this Einstein quote that, that I think about a lot. Uh, and I, magicians love this quote. And I'm sure, I'm sure magicians abuse this quote a little bit. I remember in high school, before giving a terrible show, I had it printed on my program. And I can just imagine Einstein rolling over in his grave, saying, that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> Leave me out of your terrible magic show. <laughs> But, but Einstein said, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. That is the source of all true art and all true science. And whoever does not know it, whoever can no longer stand wrapped in awe or quiet with wonder is as good as dead. And, and my fear as a magician, but also just as a person, is that as I get older, it becomes harder and harder for me to, to find moments that feel amazing or find moments that feel like they're charged with wonder. You know, when you're young, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks childhood is perfect. Uh, I have two young children now, and I'm sure they would tell you also that it's not. But it is easier when you're young to, to encounter those moments that, that are filled with wonder. I remember years ago, my cousin Carson and his family were at my house for Christmas. Carson was probably one or two, I don't remember. And, and he was sitting next to me at Thanksgiving, and I realized that, that he had probably never had ice cream before. His parents were just sort of like that. <laughs> and so I just, I, it fell upon me like, this is my duty, you know? I'm a, <laughs> I must share this with you. And so I gave him a spoonful of ice cream, and, and you could see the cold disoriented him immediately. But then he tasted it, and he looked up at me with this face that was like he was saying, your world has this? <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> When the coin disappeared on the playground, from that moment on, all I ever wanted from the world was to be a professional magician. And, and so I, I just did that as hard as I could. I hit Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. You know, this, uh, the summer I turned 22. I just, I, 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 I was not much fun in high school, but I worked really hard <laughs> at, at being a magician. And, and then I started going on tour. And, and for me, that meant living out of a suitcase, doing a show every night or every other night, but just basically living on the road all the time, performing in one city, and then waking up at 3 a.m. to drive two hours to the airport to make a connecting flight to another city, to do that over and over and over and over and over again. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever held a job that from the outside looks incredible, but as soon as you get in, you discover this grinding day-to-day -day reality that you didn't know about. Has anyone had that experience? <laughs> yeah, so, so that's what professional magic became for me because I toured for one year and I toured for another year and another year and another year. And, and what began is this grand, loving adventure, chasing this thing that I wanted more than anything in the world became first sort of a drag, and then this source of great despair. And, and I, I was just miserable. I was on the road all the time. And, and you know, I think a lot of jobs suffer from that, suffer from that, um, that grinding day-to-day -day reality. But when you're a magician and you lose that spark of wonder, like, that's, that's the whole job. <laughs> when you lose that, you have nothing. 
And I remember there was one night in particular, I was on stage in, in Milwaukee at Marquette University. And there were 700 people there and the show was going spectacularly well. And I got to the middle of it and I just, I, I had done enough. I didn't want to do it anymore. So I said, good night. I'm sorry, I'm going to be done. And I walked off and went back to my hotel and I thought, I am either going to quit or I'm going to forget everything I know about magic and just burn this to the ground and find a way to dream it all up again. You know, it's easy, I think, to, to encounter wonder in the big moments, right? Like it's easy at a magic show to put together this incredible illusion that will, will help people find this experience. And, and so I thought, I, I started looking for a big solution. Like what, what can I do? How can I, how, can I, how can I make this be less miserable than it is? And I just happened to be reading this book about traditional magic from other cultures, just very briefly, because I know none of you actually care very much about magic tricks. But, but every culture in the world has its own version of the magician, that sort of archetypal figure, right? And, and just like food or music or art, magic is, a, is an expression of a culture as, as much as anything. And I was reading about these traditions of magic that were so different from my own, and I, I had this idea. I was, going to, I was going to quit touring, and I was going to go to the other side of the world to search for snake charming and fire breathing and levitation and all these illusions that had nothing to do with what I was doing. And, and so I did that. I went, I got on an airplane and flew to the other side of the world and I set off on this adventure. It sounds ridiculous when I tell this story now, but my mission was I am going to, <laughs> I am going to find magic. And, and I, I did. I, I, I saw all of the illusions that I, that I went out to find. But when I reflected on the trip afterwards, I realized that the most magical moments were not the big illusions. They were not even the things that you'd post on Instagram, right? Like they weren't like the big sort of postcard pictures of the adventure. They were the small everyday moments. I became really fascinated with the question, where do you find wonder after you've lost it? And the answer for me was, to find it in the daily business of living. That it's not, you don't have to go to the other side of the world. It's more about how you look than where you look. And so ever since I came back, I, I've been, that, that has been what I've been trying to chase. How, how do you find it in the small moments, in the daily moments? I have a challenge for you. One of the things that you learn as a magician is that one of the best ways to discover wonder on your own is to share it with someone else. It's sort of like love in that way, right? You give it away and then you feel it, feel it for yourself. So my challenge for all of you, when you go home or when you go out into the world after the conference is over, is to choose one person in your life and orchestrate a moment for them that will be unbelievably wonderful. Maybe it's a special thing that you'll do together. Maybe it'll be a surprise. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be expensive. But I want you to see, I want you to see, uh, it's sort of like seeing magic as the person doing the trick, right? I want you to have this experience. Um, once I was on tour and I saw someone leave a tip for a waitress that was just exorbitant. I never saw how much it was, but the person the, the waitress came to collect the check and I just, she started sobbing and I thought, oh, that's magic, right? That's, that's just a different, it's like you don't have to do tricks to do magic. I'm a magician and so it's my job to find a way to put all of this into the work, right, into the show. And so for years I've been, been trying to invent an illusion that would, that would help share these ideas and these beliefs. I have something that I, I want to share with you tonight, um, but, but I, I just have to tell you this in case it goes terribly wrong. I've never done this before live. Um, the only other time I've performed this was recorded on video, and, and I'm sort of terrified that I'm going to screw it up. So I, I will try this for you with the maybe agreement that if it totally bombs, you'll give me a second chance. Is that it? All right. And, 
if the second chance totally bombs, can we, can we just forget it never happened? <laughs> can we bring out the stool, please? Give me a second, my hands are shaking. And it's hard to do sleight of hand when your hands are shaking. <laughs> okay, can we start the music, please? 